goes. Sometimes it's hard to find Find my way up into the clouds Today that it can be so loud You remind me of time When things were meant so complicated All I need is to see your face Feel my blood run out Spot in the sky, spot in the sky How do I know that it's just fabricated? Wow. try. You tell me every time. Just keep breathing and breathing and breathing and breathing. And all I gotta do is keep on breathing. Just keep breathing and breathing and breathing and breathing. It's all I gotta keep. recommending that. So now, now I can introduce Mark properly. Thank you so much. Mark, Mark Hamilton, founder and CEO of Boulder Broadcasting and Growing Boulder. Mark is a media entrepreneur, television journalist, author, filmmaker, speaker, activist, and consultant who focuses on the changing culture of aging. A multiple Emmy Award winning broadcaster, Mark is the host of Growing Boulder TV, seen on public broadcasting stations nationwide co-host of Growing Boulder Radio, executive producer of Surviving and Thriving TV, editor of Growing Boulder Magazine, director of the Emmy-nominated documentary film Conquering Kilimanjaro, Kilimanjaro, as well as the writer of two books. Um, the first one is called Rock Stars of Aging, and the new one is right here, Growing Boulder, Defy the Cult of Youth, live with passion and purpose and it's for sale if anybody want to, wants to get one there's still a couple left at the desk and I'm sure Mark will be happy to sign it for you these are fresh off the press they, so without further ado please welcome Mark Middleton yeah. am I supposed to stand on the booth sure. you don't have to yeah, you don't. Uh, I'm not if that's okay um, thank you Danny it's uh, a pleasure to be one of Danny's disciples now I, I have to say <laughs> This is truly, and I mean this sincerely, the most interesting group of people I have been with in a very long time. In a good way, I hope. Uh, no, in, in a fabulous way, in an intergenerational way, in an eclectic way, uh, in a creative way. Uh, it, it's just phenomenal. And uh, now, Priest, let me say it right. Say it again. Nasica. Yeah, that. <laughs> you can call me nasty. Uh, n nasty? Nasty. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, honestly, I think we can all say we were there. We remembered when. Uh, that was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, it, it was really great. Uh, and I uh, am grateful to uh, is it uh, the Florence Belsky Foundation and, and Danny Schneider for uh, encouraging us to come tonight. This is uh, they're very exciting for us to be here. Uh, just a word about Growing Boulder. Growing Boulder does have a television show on public broadcasting. We're on 386 channels, coast to coast. Uh, we have a website. I wish you would check it out. Uh, we uh, have a very strong social media platform. Uh, almost a million people on Facebook follow us. We have more engagement than PBS and AARP and Oprah's Network combined. Uh, so we know that we're doing something that works. Uh, our message resonates with people of all ages, which is why I'm thrilled to see people here that are younger than 40 and, and 30 and even 20. Um, growing Boulder is not about denying the realities of aging. It's not about trying to become ageless. Uh, it's not about pretending that we all are not going to go through significant challenges as we age. It is about understanding that the boundaries of what's possible as we age have been poorly drawn by an extremely ageist, overtly and aggressively ageist culture that we all live in. It's about understanding that many of the qualities that are associated primarily with youth have nothing to do at all with age. Youth does not own vitality or enthusiasm or creativity or compassion or passion or interest. Those things have absolutely nothing to do with age and everything to do with attitude. 
modern man has been on this planet for 300,000 years, give or take. And for 99.9% .9 of that time, the average life expectancy was 19 years. The average life expectancy in this country in 1900 was 47. The average life expectancy in this country in 1935 when the Social Security Act deemed that we would be, then be eligible for full retirement benefits was 62. In other words, most of us died before we even qualified for retirement. There is an entirely new life stage that has never before existed in the history of humankind. We have all, in a very real way, won the mega life lottery. There's a new life stage that enables us to live two, three, and four decades beyond what has been considered normal retirement age. That's a longer period than many of us worked in our careers. Most of us, if we're lucky, live about 30,000 days. By the time we're 65, we've got about 7,000 days left, if we're lucky. And like any commodity, yeah, we have to be lucky. I mean, let's be honest. Again, going bold is not about denying the realities of our mortality. Yep. We have to be lucky, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do everything that we can to increase the possibility that we're going to live to an old age. If you are a 65-year-old woman today, you have a 25% chance of living to 100. That's one in four. Tomorrow it may be one in two. That's the flip of a coin. I mean, it really is amazing. So by the time we're 65, we've got about 7,000 days left. And like any commodity, the less of it there is, the more valuable it should become. But for some reason in our culture, we look at it exactly the opposite. Our culture wants to depreciate us when we get beyond what it considers to be our prime. Uh, and that may be the biggest lie that is foist upon us by our culture. We are not meant to lead lives of diminishing returns. We are meant to lean into life. We are meant to seize every moment and to value every breath. Yeah. 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 Amen. And that's one of the tenets of growing bolder. A moment at 80 or 90 is every bit as valuable as a moment at 18 or 19. And we may spend it in an entirely different way, but that doesn't make it any less valuable. Even people that are in advanced stages of dementia still have the ability to experience love and joy. They still have the ability to live in the moment. And isn't that what we're all trying to do anyway? Live in the moment. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we need to figure out a way to continue to pursue passion and purpose as we age. Um, it, I know there's a woman in here tonight that's 86. Is there anybody older than 86? Is that the oldest age? We've probably done more interviews with active centenarians than, than any media organization in the world. Uh, and it's interesting that active centenarians are one of the most diverse groups of all. More women than men. Uh, but aside from that, uh, rural, urban, rich, poor, black, white, doesn't make any difference, which is good news for all of us. We all have the possibility of living to be an active 100. I can tell you that from our experience, the generation where all of the action is, is in the 90s. The non-generians. Uh, and in another 15 or 20 years, it will be the 100s. And I'll just give you a couple of examples, all of which are in my book in greater detail. Uh, but we've interviewed a woman by the name of May Laborde, who at 93, her husband died, and she decided at that age she was finally going to pursue her lifelong dream of becoming an actress. Uh, so May did what any Hollywood wannabe would, uh, would do. She got in her car from Pasadena, she drove to Hollywood, and she got an agent. <laughs> and here's a 93-year-old woman who was vivacious and every agent in town wanted her. She continued to work in film and television and commercials until she was 101. Uh, Harry Bernstein was 93 years old when his wife died, and he was so distraught. He didn't know if he wanted to continue, so he pulled out his old IBM Selectric typewriter and he began to write down some memories of his childhood, growing up in the Jewish ghetto outside of London. Uh, he enjoyed the process so much that he continued to write and his memories turned into a memoir. And he decided, you know what, this is pretty damn good, I'm going to get it published. He spent three years trying to get his book published, and finally an editor at Random House in London saw it for what it was, a brilliant piece of writing, and at 96 he had his first book published. He had two more books published before he died at 100, and he told us 
the 90s are the greatest decade of my life. <laughs> Frida Lefevre had no idea she had any artistic talent at all. She had only made one painting her entire life. She made a painting of her young daughter decades ago. Frida was in her late 70s when she was going through a box of stuff with someone in her retirement community. Uh, she pulled out the painting and a friend of hers said, you did that. And Frida said, I did. And her friend said, you know what? You got talent. That is all Frida needed to hear. She enrolled in the Philadelphia Academy of Arts. It took her six years to get her degree. And at age 100, Frida had her first one-woman show in a major art gallery. Oh, I, could, I could go on and on. Nola Ott, she was 96 years old when she became the oldest American to get a bachelor's degree. As soon as she got it from Fort Hayes State University in Kansas, she got a job as a storyteller for Carnival Cruise Line. When she got back from her cruise, she decided she wanted to get her master's, but she lived on a farm in Kansas, so between finishing the harvest, she would drive to class, back to the harvest, back to class. Finally, she decided she was just going to live on campus, so she lived in student housing with all the rest of the students. By 98 years old, and she got her master's. And she worked as a teaching assistant until she died at 101. We talked to Carl Reiner on a radio show about a month ago, and Carl told us the 90s have been the most prolific decade of my life. He's now 95, he's written six books uh, since turning 90, and every single night he sits in front of his TV with a TV tray and Mel Brooks right next to him, and they watch Jeopardy. <laughs> Which brings me to you know a couple of points that I'd like to, to just mention from my book. Um, <coughs> And I've talked to it uh, uh, with a couple of people tonight, and, and socialization is it. Uh, it. It's what keeps us going. There are more lonely older people now than ever. Yes. And research has proven that as we age, low social interaction is more harmful to our health than smoking, alcoholism, or obesity. I mean, that is a stunning statistic. 148 different studies have proven that those who have high social interaction have a 50% reduced chance of dying at any moment. Uh, so kudos to all of you for coming out and being here tonight. Uh, and it's not just having friends, it's having the right kind of friends. Much has been written about the power of positive thinking, and it is true. Thinking positively is important, but very little has been written about the power of negative thinking, and it's true that negative begets negative far more than positive begets positive. Positive thinking alone will not guarantee success in anything you want to do, but negative thinking alone will certainly do anything you want to do. Negative thinking leads to loneliness, leads to depression, and it leads to sickness. One of the things I write about in the book is the concept of prehabilitation. Uh, I call prehabilitation exercise. Prehabilitation to me is the greatest no-brainer that exists, uh, and it's the notion that we will all encounter a series of health setbacks as we age. It's unavoidable. It's part of the human condition. We are physiological beings. Knowing that, we should all be preparing for it because to a large extent, the type of interventions that are made available to us when we encounter some sort of physical or health setback will be determined by our overall fitness at the time. Beyond that, the extent of our recovery after we encounter that setback will be determined by our overall fitness at the time. You can't avoid it. Don't think of it as exercise, think of it as prehabilitation. And also think of it as the solution to the longevity paradox, which is the notion that the thing that we most aspire to, longevity, is the thing that most threatens the thing we uh, aspire to, longevity. Uh, the biggest fear of baby boomers is not death, it's running out of money before we run out of time. The number one investment that everybody in this room can make tonight costs you no money at all. It's improving your overall health and well-being. That will reduce your future health care costs, which is the biggest threat to all of our futures. We are all one major health setback away from financial ruin. So do yourself a favor. You don't have to become a competitive athlete. Uh, you don't have to aspire to, uh, you know, develop a bikini body or six-pack abs, but you have to move. There's just no way to deny that. Moving is critically important to us as we get older. Growing bolder 
when people say, what is Growing Boulder about? You know, Growing Boulder is about learning, which I think life is about. And the last great task is learning how to grow older. Um, growing Boulder is about understanding that aging is not simply about loss and limitation. It's about passion and purpose and possibility. I mean, it's really, really good news. And I just encourage everybody to believe that more is possible because the biggest, the most important determinant of how we age is not exercise, not rehabilitation, and it's not diet. The biggest lifestyle determination of how we age is our belief system. What the mind believes, the body embraces. Psychology drives our physiology. I mean, this is not my opinion. This is the opinion of one study after another. So you have to believe that more is possible. When you close your eyes and you imagine someone that's 80 or 90, imagine more. Uh, imagine a whole lot more. Uh, and I can tell just from hanging out with you guys tonight, you are so far ahead of the curve, uh, just in terms of the social engagement, the creative engagement, uh, the, the inspiration that you provide one another. Uh, and I think that's the final point I'll leave you with. I talked about the power of negative thinking. Don't ever rain on anybody's parade. Don't ever tell anybody that's a bad idea. You can't do that. Encourage everybody you know to do whatever they want to do. And, and finally, welcome to the age of liberation. If not now, when? Exactly. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, growing older is the time to take risk. And I'm not talking about risk that will put you in physical danger. I'm talking about learning how to say yes. We have been led to believe that as we age, no is the appropriate response. No, I don't want to go out tonight. No, I don't want to go to that play. No, I don't want to try that new food. No, I don't want to meet that new person. No, I don't want to take that new class. We become afraid. Fear kills us. Saying no is the kiss of death, and saying yes is the, is the breath of life. It is that simple. And we all have to learn to say yes more and more and more as we age. We are all the victims of a very subtle form of mass brainwashing. And I mean that literally. And this is not some sort of conspiracy theorist. They've done studies, and by the time we're three, we have a very negative image of aging. And this is pounded upon us day in and day out. Uh, and we see it on the TV all the time. Thousands of companies are spending billions of dollars to make us feel uncomfortable, to make us feel less than, to make us feel unworthy, to make us feel unattractive, to make us feel weak. And only their product, only their service can lead to our salvation. Self-acceptance is their enemy. It's the ruination of their business. So love yourself, believe in yourself, encourage your friends, and never stop growing bolder. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. I love if that. If you go to growingbolder.com, they sell some great t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> they sell books. They have a great magazine What's that you can subscribe can, to. Can we see but that? buy a book. What's I that? just want to say one thing. Can we see it? Oh, you're going to wear it. Yeah. I read this book, and I'll tell you, my takeaway, my takeaway from this book was, as Mark said, the mindset is so important. You're, you are... You can determine your future. It's everybody thinks it's genetically predisposed that you know, but it's only 25%. 75% is what you make of it, and and it's prehabilitation. It's keeping in shape. You have I learned new words in this book like uh, neurogenesis. You could create new brain cells. You know, even I could. Um, <laughs> corpus callosum. That's the the white stuff that connects you to brain lobes that you can grow new white brain cells if you try new things and, and take some risks. And, and just a whole epigenesis. We are in control of our own futures. And it, and it, so I'm part of Mark's cult. I don't know about you, but get this book. Tell all your friends. It's the best gift you can give to yourself or to anybody else. So thank you. Thank you. If you are here, please make sure that you give us your email because we're going to send out a big thank you email to everyone who came and there's going to be a link to buy the book.
So if you were inspired by this, yeah. give us your email, you will get a link to buy the book. Yeah. If I already have your email because you RSVP'd on the website. Thank you. <laughs>